Hi there, and welcome to the Data Action Lab podcast. Today, we'll be talking about visualization, and I have with me Stephen Davies and Patrick Boilly, who are two people who are super into visualization. And we'll be uh, continuing on from an earlier podcast we did where we discussed data visualization in sort of more general terms. But today we will be talking more specifically about a data visualization that I believe is a favorite of both of you. Well, it's certainly very influential. It's a uh, stock full of great details. It's a fantastic way to put a lot of information on one chart. Steven. Favorite's a bit of a loaded word. I wouldn't necessarily replicate anything that this visualization does in stuff that I do today, but it's a favorite in the sense of there's so many things it can teach us about how to put visualizations together. It's a brilliant learning tool. Um, it's created, you know, very, very cleanly and there's a lot of thought gone into it. And it is, of course, uh, Minard's March to Moscow. That's the one. So that's right. We'll be talking about Minard's March to Moscow. Okay, so before we get into the visualization itself, what I want to ask you is give us a little sketch of the data set itself. So the reason I'm asking you this is if you're a student or somebody who does this for work, often people just give you the data set and they'll be like, visualize this. So if you were back in the day and you're be being given the data set for this visualization, what does the data set look like? All right, so the data set itself, actually, if you download it from the web, is fairly fragmented. I think somebody's got it in an R library somewhere. I managed to find it in a couple of places online. It's not that complete. It's fairly disjointed, and the data set exists enough to create this particular visualization. But if you want to do any other kind of analysis, the data's not there. So I'm not sure if that's completely representative of what happened in the day. But uh, from our perspective as, you know, business intelligence people or data analysts, it's quite sparse. It's not easy to link together and we have to extrapolate quite a lot. But you know what? It just shows what you can do. You can take a fairly fragmented data set and extrapolate and you can still come up with something quite amazing. I believe it's available in one of the R packages. What are some of the fields that are in the data set? Well, you definitely have something about the size of the army at various points in time. Uh, we also have the locations. Is there anything else specific? We have temperature. I mean, that plays an important part because, you know, as temperature changes, we can look at the relative size of the army and we can infer that that actually had an impact. Direction of travel as well. Uh, we'll see when we look at it that there is color coding built into the visualization and the color coding represents going to Moscow and coming back from Moscow. Those are the different data fields that we're actually working with. Right. Right. That makes sense. So from that point of view, it's like, if you were just given this, you'd be like, oh, we have groups of soldiers, numbers, locations, temperature. You might not think, oh, this is going to be the raw material for a phenomenal visualization. No, actually you wouldn't. And, you know, today uh, I think people would be tempted to create this as two or three or four or five. You know, here's your graph of, you know, temperature over time and maybe, you know, you'd have army size and it would not be interpreted in the way it was done here, or at least I think very unlikely to be if you give it to a business analyst today. One of the things we teach the students is to start by doing univariate visualizations and perhaps bivariate visualizations first and to exhaust the space of low dimensional visualizations as quickly as possible to see what might be out there in the low dimensional spaces. And then, of course, when you try to combine all of these fields together to have as many elements as possible, well, there's many ways to skin that specific cat. It wasn't like steam engine time where anybody else might have come up with the steam engine except for Watt. This is a chart that has Minal's stamp all over it. Yeah, so let's go to the, the visualization now. And maybe you two can kind of walk us through... Uh, now that people have sort of the data set floating in their head, walk us through some of the key highlights of, of the visualization that was actually created from this data. So the first thing is, and it tends to jump out, is, is the number of troops. So we can see here what Minar did was he actually took the width of the line and the width of the line here represents the number of troops. 
One of the things I really like about this is it is abstracted out. I mean, there is actually a scale here on um, the original size. One millimeter is equivalent to 10,000 troops. 500,000 troops in total began and a lot fewer ended. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> that would be putting yeah. it mildly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the interesting thing is that we don't need to know that scale to know the story behind what we're seeing here, right? So that's the first thing is the number of troops is proportional to the width of the line. The second thing that is uh, extraordinarily well done on this map, and it's not evident from the first one that we saw, is uh, distance, scale. If you actually go from uh, Kunas, I think it's pronounced, to Moscow, that is approximately a thousand kilometers. When I actually took it, uh, took the march to Moscow and wanted to overlay it here onto Google Maps, I thought it would take me a long time. I may have to stretch and move things around. It was actually extraordinarily precise. So even at the beginning, the reader may not know how far it is from one of these places to the other. As soon as we have that as a reference point, we can measure different points in the map and have a very, very good sense of distance. So the third thing that the map actually represents is temperature. So we can see down here on the bottom right hand side, we actually have a temperature scale and we can see the corresponding points along the march represented by these vertical lines. What the temperature was at a certain point in time of the march. And this is very important, especially for the retreat because Napoleon ended up losing a lot of his troops due to the weather amongst a whole bunch of other things. So temperature is a big aspect of this visualization as well. You notice at the same time, so yes, the, uh, the size of the army reduces dramatically as it retreats from Moscow and, and uh, the temperature drops, but even on the way to Moscow, where we don't have temperature information, we do see the size of the army reducing as well. So it'd be tempting to say the temperature is what did them in. It is. And actually going to Moscow, um, the supply chain was a big aspect. And for example, here in Smalsk, um, 20,000 troops were lost in a battle at that point in time. And there were rear guard actions by the Russian army all the way through pretty much on his advance to Moscow. So you're right. This does not represent, leading into Moscow, uh, all the reasons why the army was lost. Supply chain, a lot of people were uh, lost starvation, for example, and dysentery. Um, but it still represents, and it's still very obvious to see a reduction in the size of the army. Presumably, this is something that the population of the time would sort of know, because they were living the war. The war was a very recent occurrence. But if you're looking at this with the benefit of a hundred years into the future, it's easy to just think of this as a, a column of tanks leaving Lithuania and weaving their ways to Moscow. That's not the reality of it. They're Muscovites. The Russians weren't just sitting there and waiting to be marched upon. They were they were fighting. There was going to be some, some battle as well. One of the things I do like about this map is that it raises enough interesting questions yeah. that you have to go and try to figure out what might have happened. And that, that's a good map. It's a map that rewards curiosity, a map that rewards interest. And in If you don't know the history, you don't know some of the background, you don't know some of the things that are included and missing in this map, then you can easily misinterpret. And that's a really good lesson to teach people today, creating visualizations. It's not just the graphics that we use or the charts that we use. It's the provision of context is absolutely key. And if we don't communicate that effectively, then these things can be very, very easily misinterpreted if we're not careful. There are a hundred other things we can talk about in, in, in this visualization, but one very obvious one that's very often overlooked is actually direction of travel. So we can see there's an inflection point here where we reverse direction. We, we get to Moscow, and uh, if we sort of read up on the history, the Russians actually evacuated Moscow. There was nobody there to greet him. The capital at the time was St. Petersburg. So there was nobody to take her surrender. There was nobody to take over from. So Napoleon had no choice but to turn around. Um, Menard chose to have two different colors. He's got beige to go out. And on the return journey, he's got black. 
And he didn't have to do that, apart from maybe points like this, where we have geographically overlapping lines. But he's made it very, very obvious by having two distinctly different colors. The eye can go to this point up here, which is Moscow, and see that something is different. And it doesn't take, you know, a genius to work out that one color is going in one direction and one color is returning. It's a very obvious thing, but we should really be thinking about these very obvious things when we create our own visualizations. Some of the troops were sent in a slightly different direction and they waited in this location. Even though they're not marching to Moscow anymore, they're staying in Polotsk. And at some point they decide to retreat, which is shown in black, even though in theory they're moving eastwards, they're still retreating, they're coming back. You see them coming down here, they join up with the forces, and you see this line here is thicker yep. than the line that was coming beforehand, which means that their retreat was timed to coincide with whenever the army reached that point as well. So presumably this branch of the army sort of stuck there and waited a fair amount of time, right? The time it took for the rest of the army to get to Moscow and to come back and sort of reach back here again. So even though we do not have a timeline for what's happening up there, we can infer something about the situation, even though it's not explicitly stated or written on the actual chart. So a question for both of you. What, in your opinion, is the most ingenious aspect of this visualization? It's just the abstraction of magnitude. I mean, you know, the most important message here is we went from a very big army to a very small army and really nowhere on the visualization is the size of the army mentioned at all. You know what I mean? It's, it's abstracted in a very interesting and very simple way that's able to get the story across very, very quickly. So, I mean, it's the very obvious one I wanted to jump in with, but for me, that's that's the whole crux of the, of the visualization, right? Great, right, that's brilliant. Pat, thoughts? One of the things I, I actually do like about this visualization is that if you were just to give me the visualization alone, no context, no explanation, no little text. I couldn't make sense of this. I don't recognize it as anything. It just feels like some random abstract art. But as soon as you give me just a little bit of context, you tell me that this is the march to Moscow and you give me a little bit of information, all of it starts making sense. All of this uh, fits into place. And then you realize that there's an actual story that is being told in a very clever way. So what mm -hmm. I like about this is that it's a clever visualization and one that rewards a second look, a third look, a fourth look, one that makes you question what might have happened historically rather than just randomly presenting information. Like some people say, oh, this is great. I get what's happening right away. First glance. It's good to have visualizations that you can get the, the whole picture with a one glance. But I love the fact that a second glance and a third glance and a fourth glance actually really help cement the understanding of the story. And the story is, this was a disaster for the French. <laughs> this was horrible. I wonder if, when Minard released this map, which wasn't like right as it was happening, obviously, how did the general population of France react to this map? Because it's it's a bit of an indictment on, yeah. on the way the war was conducted. That is a perfect lead-in to my final question, in fact. Is the march to Moscow emotionally evocative for you? And broadly speaking, do you think evoking an emotional response has a role in data visualization more generally? It is emotionally evocative. Um, look, I'm not a historian. I'm a data person. I think we do the discipline a disfavor when we decide that data is just bites on the cloud or uh, pencil marks on a sheet of paper. Data is supposed to represent something other than just data. Uh, we spout a lot of what sounds to be like very Zen truth statements about correlation not being causation and, um, you know, p-values and what have you. Blah, 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 blah. But the reality is that data doesn't live in a vacuum, right? To get data, you need to query people or you need to query a situation. It's an ecosystem. It's all interconnected. Our emotions are also connected to the situation. There is no such thing as a pure data set that is disconnected altogether from any sort of emotional response. It's easy to get carried away with too much emotion when we analyze things. It's easy to let the story become 
what we think it should have been rather than what it actually is. But to go the other route, to go the other way and say, I want no emotions at all. I want nothing at all. I just want cold, hard facts. I think we do a disservice to discipline. I think we harm people by dissociating the situation that the data is supposed to represent and the actual data slash visualization. So for me, this is a good visualization, very influential. It helps you understand. Obviously, Mina was like trying to say something other than just these are the facts. But that's not a bad thing, I don't think. I think we would benefit from an emotional component to our visualizations in general. I say this as a robot, basically, somebody who has no emotions. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I think this would be a positive thing. Right. Steve, what's, what's your take on it? Absolutely. I mean, our genius here was picking a dimension to analyze that evokes emotion. He could very easily have plotted, you know, here are the towns and cities that were taken by the Napoleonic army, because many were, and some were sacked, and he could have had a series of green dots for cities that were taken and red dots for cities that weren't, right? And it would have told a similar story that Napoleon went into Moscow, or went into Russia, took some cities, failed at some point, and then came back, right? He chose to represent instead death, <laughs> right? And yeah. it tells the same story, but because of the thing he has chosen to represent the story, it is evoking an emotion inside of us. So we can choose to tell the same story in different ways. And one of the lessons here is let's try and pick those things that evoke the biggest emotion. Even in a business sense, you can choose things that panic people in a good way, right? As opposed to telling a story where people just gloss over if I can pick a dimension to choose that instills panic or inspiration in somebody, then that means that visualization will get noticed and it will get acted upon, which is essentially why we do this. Right. And I mean, in a way, it's important to recognize, I guess, that they do have the power to evoke emotion yeah. and yeah. it is important. But let's also do that responsibly. By your own admission, you're not a, a data visualization person to the same extent that Stephen and I would be. Does it evoke an emotion in, in you? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it actually evokes a real empathetic response for me because looking at this, it makes me want to imagine what it was like to be a soldier in that situation. And, you know, I sort of imagine all of the, the soldiers starting out with this great sense of, of, you know, here we go. And then imagining those soldiers from that first group that have made it back because that's the same. There's going to be some soldiers in the first part that have made it back into the by the end of it, what were they thinking as they came back through that same space and their numbers just kept dwindling? So yeah, I think for me, it is a very uh, evocative visualization. And I think that's a p real power of visualizations. I, it's something that I'm really intrigued by. Now, Stephen, you've written a blog article about this. Yeah, if you, if you go to the Data Action Lab website and, and go to the blog page and uh, there's a category for data visualizations or just type in search Minard, you'll find it. There's a little bit more detail in the blog article than we've gone through here. It's certainly not as much detail. People have written books on this, so I've, I've not gone to, to that level. And um, there's a whole bunch of resources. If, if anybody wants any more resources than this, just go to our website and send us an email and we'll be happy to uh, point you in the right direction. Here's another map. We're not going to talk about this map at all. A different chart that tells a different story about a different situation and scenario altogether. There is also a blog article that basically describes how you might want to take a look at this Gapminder World 2012 map, mapping the wealth and health of nations. Okay, well, that wraps it up for this podcast. Thanks to all of you out there for listening and following along. If you have any ideas for future podcasts that you'd be interested in, please get in touch with us. And in the meantime, happy data visualizing. We'll see you soon.